I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Paul Argus, a fractional chief customer officer who helps mid-sized companies embed data-driven customer strategies across their organizations. Paul is a Kiwi based in Sydney, Australia. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for having me, Jay. Really appreciate it. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. You've left the corporate executive world to build your own business to secure your income, savor your independence, and succeed on your terms. But you have to get past the struggles of acquiring clients, building a pipeline, and getting paid what you're worth. In this podcast, Jay Kingley, the CEO of Maven, and his guests share their best practices, tips, and tricks on how you can get out of Struggle City and into Success City and beyond. Enjoy today's episode. Paul, I'm the CEO of a $50 million company that sells cloud-based software that helps businesses manage their logistics and delivery. We have a great product, but our growth has stalled out. When we bump into each other for the first time at a business conference, you've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch, go. Thanks, Jay. A lot of companies that size are on what I call the monthly target treadmill. So what that is, is a vicious cycle of acquisition campaigns, discounts, and sales incentives. So what we do is we help eliminate that lumpy revenue and generate more sustainable growth through data-driven customer strategy. Um, that focus is very much on building capability, not short-term campaigns. So Paul, when you talk about, uh, you know, customer driven. I, I've always heard you can be customer driven, you can be product driven, you can be employee driven, and there's probably a couple of other drivens that you could come up with. What is what is it that makes a customer driven strategy better than let's say a product driven strategy? For me at the end of the day, you need to focus everything around the person that's actually paying money. Every business whether they have employee-driven values or customer-driven values, it's all about making money. You do that through happy customers, happy shareholders, happy employees, of course. But for me, the most important thing you need to do is focus on the person that's actually opening up their wallet. So the, that for me is why I, I prefer to take that approach. Um, and then it's very much around understanding that customer, their needs, bringing the data in um, to use the voice of the customer and not opinion-based um, decision-making. So who would you serve? In other words, who is the, the, the a great client for you and how would you define your target market? Yeah, definitely mid-sized companies for me. Um, the thing that a lot of my clients have in common is that they've established product market fit and they're at that next stage of growth, but they're, they're struggling to get that next kick of growth because they've exhausted all the low-hanging fruit. Um, a lot of the clients that I work with are B2B, so the founder has used a lot of their network to get that initial growth and um, to move to that next stage. Obviously, from a scale perspective, you can't rely on your personal relationships anymore. You need to, you need to go beyond that. So um, uh, a lot of the time as well, they've kind of reached that point through a lot of performance marketing, a lot of paid media, a lot of short-term tactics. Um, and again, they're starting to find that the return on those um, isn't what they need. So. Um, generally, five to $100 million turnover here in Australia, um, between 20 and 200 employees is, is around what we define a mid-sized um, business as. Um, and the industries, um, Jay, I've got a lot of experience in SaaS, um, financial services and real estate. So anywhere where the industry relies on um, a long-term customer relationship um, to deliver success. Paul, what, what I'm hearing you say is that most companies in the early days, when they think about getting those initial customers tend to do what I call a very ad hoc approach, which is, hey, it's my company. I'm going to go through my contacts list, see who I know, see who I can get introduced to. And what I'm hearing you say is that only goes so far. And I've got to turn away from being ad hoc to a more structured, process-driven approach. And if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that that has to be focused around your customer, not your product, not your employees, not your shareholders. 100%. 
The other way I look at it when I talk about that treadmill is it's, it's always focused on getting more customers. Acquisition, short term, discount it, get that new customer on board and hit that monthly target. Whereas a customer focused approach takes more of a lifetime value metrics. So what we're looking there is we've got Jay on board, but what's his average lifetime value? How long does Jay stay for? How much is Jay spending over his lifetime? The vast majority of company revenue comes from existing customers, yet most of the focus is on the people that aren't currently customers. And so obviously I'm not saying that you, you, you don't need an acquisition strategy, but you need to protect what you have first and grow that. And of course, your customers are your biggest advocates, right? and that's where you do get your organic growth. So what outcomes can clients expect when they move towards this customer-driven strategy based on lifetime? The first one is a series of always-on optimized programs. Ditch the short-term campaigns and look at an ongoing customer onboarding program, an ongoing MQL program. Just to find for the audience what an MQL is? So in B2B, um, marketing qualified leads, um, they get passed on to the sales team um, um, for them to qualify or accept as a, as a sales qualified lead or a sales accepted lead. And so in a lot of B2B industries, um, there's a constant uh, pressure for marketing to deliver MQLs, to hand over to the sales team to, to convert. And so effectively, the two levers that the company is pulling all the time is how can we improve the MQL cost per lead? So we make it lower to, to bring that lead in. And how can we improve the conversion rate on those leads? Um, and as you're aware, Jay, that is what creates the classic, is it the quality of the leads or is it the quality of salesperson um, argument between the sales and marketing teams that you know, yell at each other from different sides of the fence? So um, yeah, that's, that's a big one. For me, the, um, the other one is um, in any company, whether it's B2B or B2C, You've got to get your target market and your value proposition for that target market correct. And, and again, uh, um, you might have heard the term ICP, which stands for Ideal Customer Profile. So within your target market, you've got what you would refer to as your ideal customer, the type of person that is absolutely going to love that product. What type of industry are they from? What type of job title are they, um, do they have? A lot of the time, what will happen is that pressure on the salespeople and the marketing people to bring those leads and sales in they go well beyond the ICP. And what that means is, is that, sure, they might acquire some of these customers, but they become lower quality customers who are more likely to churn. And then again, that just feeds the cycle. I had a client uh, towards the back end of last year who had a 40% churn rate. And when we looked into it, we actually realized that the clients were all using the product, but a lot of the customers that were bringing on board were unsustainable because they were too small. They were going out of business. They didn't have an ongoing need for the products. Capability for me is is having the capability to have a clear ICP idea, idea to that ideal customer profile and then using customer data and research, create value propositions which are actually genuinely motivating for those, um, for those targets. So um, everything for me is about creating a long-term asset as opposed to a short-term sugar hit. Paul, you said something that I just want to elaborate on because I thought it was particularly insightful. You said that how marketing gets under pressure to deliver these marketing qualified leads at ever lower cost. If I think about finance, a tried and true concept in finance is net present value. I take the future, hopefully positive cash flows from, for example, an investment. I discount them back to present time using my cost of capital and subtract any investment that I've made in order to do that project. So it would seem to me that the right way for marketing to look at it is to say, I'm attracting these MQLs who have a certain lifetime value. And of course, based on the quality of that MQL, the lifetime value changes. And now I can subtract the cost of acquiring that MQL from the specific lifetime value I'm getting. Because it might be that I should spend more money to attract an MQL if it's if the return from the, the lifetime value is high enough, whereas if I just look at minimizing the cost, I could 
be even more minimizing the value so that I'm in a net negative situation. Is that, is that the way it should be? Jay, there's a, uh, a standard kind of benchmark uh, ratio of three to one. So you want a three to one ratio between your LTV, your lifetime value, and your CAC, your customer acquisition costs. So if I can acquire a customer for um, $1,000, we want the lifetime value to be $3,000. Um, and so absolutely, if, if you can extend that LTV, you can either increase your profits or you can afford uh, to generate the lead or acquire the customer at a, at a higher, higher amount. And um, it, it's funny, so many, so many, customer, uh, so many companies uh, focus very much on first year value as their return when you know, ultimately you know, these customers, if you're staying for two or three years on average, you've got three times that value coming in. So it gives your marketing a lot more room to move. But, um, you know, again, the performance marketing approach, which so many B2B companies particularly focus on at the expense of brand, um, is also part of that cycle because you're forever looking for that extra half a percent to make that next monthly target. And I'm not saying that performance marketing isn't useful and you should be optimizing, but for a lot of companies, they're almost shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic. They're not, they're not driving transformational change. Um, we talk a lot about demand generation versus demand capture. Um, in marketing, a lot of small to medium companies, again, particularly B2B, will focus very much on demand capture at the start through paid search, that kind of stuff, at the expense of demand generation. Probably your biggest asset, as I've talked about, is your brand. And if you're not investing in that and you're just focusing on the demand capture, you're not building um, for a bigger, sustainable future. Paul, what you say makes so much sense. So it begs the question, or why are these mid-sized B2B companies struggling to implement the approach that you're talking about? Uh, Jay, I've actually been lucky enough to, to run sales teams and, and have you know, positions on exec teams. And so I've had a little insight into this. And the short answer is, is that monthly targets don't go away. So people like me can come in and say all of this stuff. But Paul, in two weeks' time, I've got to hit the next monthly target. And we only just scraped it last month. So my focus for the next two weeks is ensuring that we hit that number. But that's generally the biggest reason why companies don't do this stuff because you know, they understand that unifying data, taking lifetime value-based approach, reorganizing structures around the customer, they're all reasonable, suitable things to do. But they take time and they take focus. And I don't have the time to do that because I'm worrying about staying in my job for the next three months. Um, so that, that's a really big one um, that, that stops people from, from, from doing it. And then the other one is, of course, you know, the medium-sized companies will often have, if I speak about the marketing, the, the marketing person will, will be a, a CMO or possibly a, a head of marketing by that stage as they get a bit bigger. But it's often a more junior marketer that has come through the performance marketing you know, course, I guess. Um, and those are the levers that they know how to pull. So those are the levers that they continue to pull. So yeah, those would be the, t- the two. Um, and then the, I guess the third one, just to give you another one, would be customer strategy. It's only useful if everyone in the company is A, understands it, and B, is behind it. So uh, most companies have a strategy. A lot of them will have something around the customer, but they kind of get presented at the start of the year and put on the shelf, and then that's the end of it. And for them to truly work, you actually need to take them almost on a roadshow. You need to organize the uh, the, um, the business um, along that um, along that format. Maybe even having a chief customer officer that owns um, all of the aspects of it. So there's a lot of structures uh, and behavior changes that need to occur for for this to to happen. So let's just explore that uh, a little more deeply. You, you you've talked a lot about the symptoms, if I can use that word, from driving your business using performance marketing. So what's your insight into what is the real underlying issue? What is it that a client, a a CEO of a a mid-market B2B company, what is it in their thought process that they need to change or, or what is it that they need to think differently about to get beyond this trap? I'm going to use an analogy here. I hope it's a, I hope it's a good one. Let's say that you are someone who is wanting to get healthier and for, for many years has maybe been, you know, I say kilos, you'd say pounds, but looking to use, lose a few pounds. 
So you've used a series of diets and you've kind of gone off and on and, and you're, and you're, you know, you do well and then you kind of fall back. For the CEO and they're using that analogy, what they need to do is they actually need to change their lifestyle, um, as opposed to constantly going on diets. Um, my brother's actually a, a sports trainer for a professional sports team and he talks about having a diet for life. So eat, eat the, eat the pizza, you know, have the beer, but have a program for life as opposed to I'm not going to eat pizza for a month and then, you know, I'll come back onto it. So, you know, for the, for the change that we're looking for here, they actually need to take that approach of I'm setting this company up for life, not for the next few months to, to get by. And that's a really tough thing for a CEO to do because they're always under pressure to hit the numbers. And so what Paul and Co does is we're able to come in in parallel while they're worrying about those monthly targets and start to build that capability and drive the change. And so they can start to move from a, you know, a constant focus on monthly targets with you know, very little long-term organic capability to relying more on the organic capability and less so on the, on the targets. You said something that's very perceptive that I don't think I uh, thought about, which is you don't implement this by one day you're on the performance marketing short-term treadmill and the next day you're taking a long-term LTV, you know, customer value approach. You have to keep what you're doing going while you introduce and bring up more of the LTV approach. And as that comes up, then you can start to take the performance marketing uh, short-termism down. So you're really running these things in parallel, where as the new comes up, the old comes down. I, I think a, a lot of people probably think about this. It's I've got to do one or the other. How do I make the transition? Yeah, some of the clients I've worked with, you know, I've looked in and again, I guess because I've done a lot of SaaS, churn is a is a big one. And, you know, if you ever want to kind of understand you know, the power of an ongoing customer relationship, work in the SaaS industry because that is you know, really how they make their money. Um, and the first thing I want to understand if they're looking at that is, okay, well, what, what, let's look at the metrics. So let's look at the platform usage data. Let's look at the CRM data. Let's look at the billing data. Let's bring everything together. And I'll ask a question, which is like, oh, how does that churn varying by industry? Or how is that churn varying by this? And a lot of the time they can't answer that because the data isn't available to them in a format that's needed to, to do that. We'll hack together Excel sheets um, for phase one. So when you talk about that journey, I'm not saying that you're going to have this fancy data center on, on, on week one, but what we can probably do is working with the analysts of the team is hack together a view in an Excel sheet, um, get the answers, and then start to look to you know migrate that across to a centralized customer data platform. A lot of the stuff that we start with is quite hacky, and that's okay because the hacky stuff will still give you the answers. It's just a very manual way to do that. And from a capability perspective, you want to automate that. You want to have data integrated. You look at that as phase two. You've got a great take on all of this, Paul. So it makes me wonder, what experiences have you had in your career that has enabled you to develop these insights that you clearly have, but to be honest, so many of your competitors don't have? I've had a variety of roles. I mean, maybe starting with just the, the kind of exec roles or C-suite roles. I was surprised early on in my career presenting to boards and obviously being very nervous presenting to a board or answering their questions. And they ask incredibly insightful questions, but even the boards will still ask, how, how's monthly target looking? <laughs> um, a lot of the discussion is focusing so much on the next, let's say, two weeks to maximum three months. And I know asking them, you know, when I go out and have a, have a drink with some of these people to learn from them, they say, we don't want to be asking those questions. We want to be talking about the next one to two years. but um, we were unable to do that because the state of the company is so much on delivering that um, short-term number. So um, I've seen it happen, but I know the desire exists. A lot of what I'm saying isn't, isn't rocket science. It's more around, well, how do we do that um, from a capability perspective and, and from an execution and timing perspective? So I think that's a big one. Um, as I said before, I've been on the sales and marketing fence, so I understand the pressures. A big one for me, I was chatting with a client last week 
And she said, oh, I've never really thought about this um, before. And I just said, marketing's role doesn't end when they hand their MQL over. Marketing's role is bringing that customer through to a closed sale and helping them on board and helping them grow. So when the salesperson is calling them, marketing should be automating emails from that salesperson or sending collateral or helping with sales enablement tools. Um, you've got to bridge that gap. And for me, you've got to stop this handover point of here's the lead. It's over to you. Uh, I, I was working full time um, a few years ago and there was, it was interesting because I was brought in and they said, right, we need to drop the cost per lead and sales needs to improve the conversion. Paul, your job is the cost per lead. Get the cost per lead down. And I did a presentation to the company and I said, I can, I can halve your cost per lead tomorrow. And like, oh, hold on. What? How are you going to do that? I said, well, there's a caveat. I said, I can halve your cost per lead tomorrow, but it probably won't make you much more money because there's a whole bunch of industries here which are very, very, very low cost per lead, but also very, very, very low conversion on those leads. So would you like me to halve the cost per lead because I can do that or would you like me to help us make more money? Because there's a bunch of customers in here or potential customers which are much higher cost per lead, but they can be like five times the rate. So I can spend a bit more on the cost per lead, but sales will convert more because they're better leads. So which one would you like me to do? Because my KPIs, my bonus is based on cost per lead right now. And you know, I think for me, that's just another example of that focus on the wrong metrics. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about Paul. You've spent the last 25 or more years working your way up the corporate ladder, achieving success and reward along the way. Whether corporate kicked you to the curb or you walked out the door of your own volition, there is no going back. You're nowhere close to retiring, so you're moving on to your second act as a fractional executive. You're feeling the thrill of freedom mixed with the dread of the unknown. You're not alone. Maven works with the elite 20%, turning the top fractional executives' aspirations into reality easily and quickly. Imagine the right clients needing your genius, chasing you to get it, and happy to pay you for the impact you make. Maven helps you build all aspects of your business to fund your lifestyle without having to work corporate hours. With Maven, market yourself easily, select your clients with purpose, and build a business that leverages your genius on your terms, not on someone else's. Reach out to Jay at j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com. Transform your expertise into a prosperous business where you'll make the impact you want with all the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned. Welcome back. We're talking to Paul Argus, a fractional CCO or Chief Customer Officer who helps mid-sized companies become customer-centric. Paul, let's find out a bit more about you. And let me start with what happened in your life, personally or professionally, that most explains why you're doing what you do today? Oh, as you said before, I'm originally from New Zealand. I've been here in Sydney for, for about 18 years now, so it's been a fair while. But I guess for me, where I grew up, and I had a, I had a great childhood, but um, single parent, um, low income, um, small country town in New Zealand, um, which was a fantastic place to grow up. But, you know, we didn't have a lot. And I think from an early age, you know, I think I, I left home at barely 18 and went to university somewhere else and, and kind of paid for myself to kind of go through uni. So I was always kind of searching for, I'd, I'm saying something better, but better is probably not the right word, but something different for what I wanted. Moving to Australia as well has been part of that. I guess I'm always looking to kind of build something better. Um, and, you know, whether that's for my children here, um, but also, you know, for the companies that I'm in, I, you know, I like to, genuinely kind of improve things as opposed to kind of, um, you know, more of the same. So how long have you been a fractional CCO? And, and what advice would you give to other fractional executives? I've, I haven't been full time with, with the fractional the whole time I've been doing it. So it's been, it's been 12 years. I was I kind of fell into it a little bit. Um, so I was working at Australia's biggest bank. I was there for four years and I was lucky enough to meet um, a couple of um, CEOs that we were doing some business with and they asked me to come and do some um, 
consulting with them. Um, and funnily enough, uh, it was fractional before fractional was a term. So they said, you know, can I have two days and can I have three days? And so they said, let's just do it for a few months. And those few months turned into a couple of years and those couple of years turned into six years. Yeah, uh, one company got bought out by IBM and the other one said, that's fine. We'll take the extra couple of days. And um, I did that. And then maybe you should just come and jump on um, with us full time. So I stayed with that company, um, which was a B2B SaaS company for another couple of years. So it was like eight years in total. Um, and then moved to a couple of other full-time roles, and I did the fractional stuff um, on the side. Um, and so more recently, probably for the last six months, um, I've been back into it on a more full-time capacity. Uh, for me, it's been something that um, I've thoroughly enjoyed doing um, almost as a hobby sometimes and then sometimes more as my full-time capacity. In terms of the, the advice, you, you actually – taught me this. Um, it's something that's resonated and I've told a bunch of other fractional, so I'll, I'll share it um, with the audience. But well, I've got it here, experience, expertise, uh, insight and wisdom uh, curve that you talked about was, was really interesting to me. So for the audience, um, what Jay was explaining to me is, is that a lot of fractionals will talk about their experience. I worked at Commonwealth Bank, and so therefore I'm great. Um, or expertise, which is if you've got a problem, I can solve it. Um, and then the insight one is a little bit more complex where it was like, well, I can tell you why that problem is occurring. And then you've got your wisdom, which is the ultimate. And a lot of the fractionals that I see, they're selling their time and they're selling almost like a, a seat filler capability gap. Like, hey, you can grab me for a fraction of the price. Um, I even had something similar to that on my website a few months ago. And it's, it's drastically changed now because I think... If you're going to pitch yourself at that end, you're going to constantly be seen as another good alternative. Um, and so I guess what I've been really focusing on um, more recently is, is well, what do I do differently and what do I do that I, effectively the company doesn't have the capability to do um, in-house? Well, Paul, I, I have to thank you for, for sharing that. I, I do want to tell our audience that Paul has received no remuneration. <laughs> <laughs> in return for talking about that. So thank you uh, for sharing that. But that, as you know, is something that uh, I think is key to the success for any fractional is focus on your insight and wisdom. Stay away from your experience or expertise. It's a difference between living in the squalor and misery of struggle city versus the prosperity of success city. So, so Paul, what's next for you over the coming 12 months yeah i found some some green shoots actually working with um agencies so smaller digital and creative agencies that aren't big enough to have a, a traditional strategic planner that you'll see in a lot of bigger agencies um and so um i'm going to probably lean into that a little bit more um it's really really kind of interesting opportunity where They've said, look, we don't have the capability to deliver a customer strategy for our clients, but our clients are asking us for it because they trust us. And so I'm able to come in and partner with those um, agencies and, and deliver that for their clients. So that's been, um, that's been really interesting. Probably more of the same with regards to the industries. So, um, continue to focus on, you know, software as a service, um, and fintech and, and property. Um, funnily enough, I've got a, perfect ICP client right now, which is a um, property data software as a service platform. Um, and and they're having some um, challenges at the moment, which um, I'm really looking forward to helping them solve. So um, yeah, very passionate about, about property generally, actually. It's a bit of a hobby of mine. Um, and then I guess speaking of hobbies for me, um, I am terrible at Spanish, but doing my best to get better. So I'm, I'm looking to spend a little bit more time uh, improving my Spanish. Paul, I know we have people in our audience that would love to reach out and start engaging which, with you. What is the best way for them to do that? Uh, I've got a pretty unique surname, Argus. So you can just search for Paul Argus um, on LinkedIn, or if you want to email me, it's paul at paulco.com.au. We will put Paul's contact information in our show notes for both the podcast and vodcast. Paul, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcast on all the major platforms in our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients 
and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned.